Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Saw 3 in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Saw 3, released in 2006, and the last Saw movie to be written by Lee Whannell. The third Saw continues the ever more complicated storyline, bringing back characters we know and introducing plenty we don't and sticking most of them in traps that continue to get more graphic. But for this script, Whannell wanted to hit more emotional beats as well, so there's a lot of focus on the fraught relationship between Jigsaw and his traptress in training, Amanda Young. One thing Saw 3 does succeed in is being the longest of the Series. This thing is nearly two hours long. Does it justify that lengthy runtime with a whole bunch of kills? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins right where we left off, with Eric Matthews stuck in the shit room. He finds the hacksaw and evidence of what he's supposed to do with it, but when push comes to saw, he just can't bring himself to do a full Elwes. Instead, he grabs the Zep head toilet tank lid and chooses to Hulk smash instead of Gordon cut, beating the shit out of his own foot with many squishy sound effects until he's able to give it a nasty crack and slide straight on out of the chain. Congrats, Matthews, you just earned yourself a title card. But this movie isn't about Eric Matthews, so let's move on to these other cops who are cutting their way into a room. Wait, I know that lead cop, it's Daniel Rick the hot-headed dude from Saw 2. But, uh, this movie isn't really about him, either. Someone call Carrie. Carrie! Hell yeah, she's been here since the OG Saw. This movie must be about her, then. She's worried about Matthews, who's been missing for six months now, and is terrified that they just found him in pieces all over this crime scene. But those body chunks aren't Donnie Dubs. Instead, they belong to this dude Troy, who, as we see in a flashback, found himself hooked up to a bunch of chains in the middle of a classroom. Welcome to Hellraiser 101, Troy. They must have a sub today, because there's a TV teaching the lesson. On the screen is Professor Puppet, Billy to his friends. I wanna play a game. Of course you do, Billy. Billy says Troy squandered some privileges he had since birth and now seems to be most comfortable in chains since he's a repeat offender of some sort. Hence this whole situation, because you know Jigsaw loves to personalize his traps. For Troy to survive, he's got to break those chains before this little bear bomb goes off. Not exactly an easy task, and if that lip ring kill in Bride of Chucky bothered you, you might want to look away. Troy does his best, ripping out chains attached to his hands, his shoulders, his sides, but the whole time we're sitting there wondering about the elephant chain in the room, the massive one through his jaw. I don't think you'd be able to survive ripping that out, but we never get to find out. The timer reaches zero, and we cut back to the aftermath of Troy Boy in pieces all over the floor. Inspecting this case with Rig and Carrie is Detective Mark Hoffman. Fun fact, he's named after producer Greg Hoffman, who helped develop the series from the start, but sadly died right after Saw 2 came out. In a very kind gesture, Greg Hoffman was posthumously credited as a producer on all of the rest of the Saw films, and I think that's really sweet. But this Hoffman, Mark, is only in this one scene in this movie, and he doesn't really make too much of an impression. Man, wouldn't it be so funny if he ended up becoming, like, the main character later on? Carrie figures out that this Troy trap may not have been Jigsaw. After all, they had to cut the door down to get into the room. Even if Troy had dejawed himself, he wouldn't have been able to get out with the door welded shut. And it doesn't fit the Jigsaw MO. That night, she's going over the billy tape and doing some light bedtime casework when her TV switches to a different static image. And now, don't be too alarmed, Carrie, but it looks like it's a live feed of you in this very moment. She acts quick and fires her gun towards the feed since Allison Carrie is a total badass. But when she's fishing the camera out of the closet, she doesn't hear a little oink oink coming behind her. Pighead drives drives Carrie to Trap Town, where she wakes up in a contraption that once again involves a bunch of chains. Saw 3 is getting pretty Cenobite on us here, man. Billy pops up on screen and says hi. I want to play a game. He, like, criticizes her for being too good at her job? What? I don't know. It sounds like bullshit, but maybe I missed something being too focused on just how ripped Dina Meyer is. Get it, girl? Her trap involves these clamps hooked into her rib cage, and she has a minute to unlock it and escape. Only problem is, the key is chilling in a vat of acid, which Billy says is gonna hurt, and also dissolve that key pretty soon. Carrie goes for it, and although her first attempt fails, she grins and bears it and dissolves a hearty amount of hand skin to fish the key out of the acid. Like the true badass she is, she succeeds seeds and unlocks the padlock to the device. But wait, why is it not opening? It's not opening! Carrie, ask this person for help! She gets no help from the person, who is obviously Amanda, and instead gets her ribs torn apart and her insides exposed in a very gnarly and memorable trap. It introduces an important plot point for this movie, that of the inescapable trap, but I'm still sad to see Carrie go, cause like, who the hell is this movie about then? I guess this random chick, Lynn, who we meet in the middle of a lover's quarrel, that reaches its climax right as she's on her way out the door. What is it you want from me, Chris? A divorce. 
She doesn't have an answer for that, and instead leaves to go to the hospital where she works. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Saw 3 is kind of a medical drama. If it wasn't for all the gory deaths, it could be something you watched on CBS. Especially the scene where our doc protagonist gets a prep talk from her co-worker about how she's supposed to be the best, but she's been slipping lately. Luckily, things take a turn for the Saw pretty quickly when Lynn gets abducted by Pighead and jump cuts. She wakes up in a room full of Saw trap materials. Our Jigsaw apprentice, Amanda, greets her with a knife and wheels Lynn into another room where we find the man himself, John Cray looking pretty, uh, well, not great. Amanda gives Lynn his medical file and she recognizes his name and the fact that Lawrence Gordon was his doctor. I was his patient and he was mine. Float out your ass, dude. Lynn says the tumor he has is bad news bears and he whines about her lack of bedside manner and use of medical jargon. His criticisms of these people are getting outright ridiculous. You're the type of person who swallows antidepressants to hide the pain. Oh no, she takes SSRIs. Better stick a fucking bear trap on her head. Nah, she doesn't get the bear trap. Jigsaw's game for her involves this collar that Amanda fixes around Lynn's neck. Jigsaw explains. The device that you're wearing is linked to my heart rate monitor. The second that heart rate monitor flatlines, or you move out of range, an explosion will go off in that collar. So their lives are linked. Better get doctoring, Lynn. As Amanda explains, Lynn has to keep John alive for as long as it takes another test subject to complete his tasks. The other test subject is this dude who wakes up inside a crate suspended in the air. This is Jeff, one of the most frustrating characters in all of these movies. I want a root for you, Jeff, but you make it so hard. He finds a tape player that says he's consumed with anger and vengeance against the drunk driver who killed his son, and the court system that let him walk free. Jeff's about to go through a series of tests that he'll have to win through the power of forgiveness, but he's gotta do it in two hours, or else he'll be locked in this place forever and die. Jeff crashes out of the crate, and the fall gives him a little flashback to when he was playing Dirty Harry in the mirror, imagining a confrontation with the man who ran down his son Dylan. His anger over the loss caused him to be a drunk dad, and neglectful to his still-living child, daughter Corbett. That that kind of piss poor parenting gets him a visit from old Pighead, who is hiding in his bedroom to dad nap him. Amanda watches present day Jeff on a monitor and reports back to Jigsaw that the test has begun. He's out of the box. Lynn tells Amanda that John is in real bad shape and needs to get to a hospital. But Amanda don't take too kindly to that suggestion and says it ain't gonna happen, Lynn. Get saving or get dying. Amanda is so freaking aggro that even sociopathic John Kramer tells her to chill the fuck out and let the doctor do her thing. Yeah, cause her job's already hard enough, Mandy. John's not only puking up bile, he's also got blood coming out his mouth, getting his oxygen mask all gross. Lynn's able to stabilize him, but says he needs to have an operation. Is it water on the knee? No, it's a, it's a brain tumor. Amanda says she'll hook Lynn up with whatever she she needs to do the operation there, cause again, that trip to the hospital just ain't gonna happen. Quit asking, Lynn. Back to Jeff, who's exploring his plastic shrouded surroundings when he finds a door saying, face your fears. He walks through it into a freezer and finds a very blue, very naked lady handcuffed in place. She wakes up and complains about the cold, and Jeff finds a tape that tells him this chick Danica is chained in place to prevent her from running, like she did the day Dylan died. She was the only witness to the accident, and she drove off and refused to testify, hurting the case against the driver. If Jeff wants to save Danica's life, he'll have to fetch a key hung up behind some frozen pipes. And he'd better do it quick, too, cause Danica's getting intermittently sprayed down with water that instantly freezes to her body. Unfortunately, quick is not even close to being in Jeff's vocabulary, and he stands there complaining as Danica's situation gets more and more dire. Eventually, her pleading works, and Jeff goes for the key, getting his face a Christmas story to the pipes in the process. He powers through and gets a chunk of cheek meat torn off, but it's too late, you slow motherfucker. Danica's frozen solid by the time he gets back to her, having been sprayed by so much water that she's become nothing more than a bystander. Standard sickle. After Amanda gets Lynn everything she needs for the operation, we're shown the beginning of Amanda and John's relationship in a flashback to a time when Billy was a brand new puppet. In fact, his paint was still drying as John sets up Amanda's trap. The Saw movies do this a lot. They take scenes from earlier movies and show us the setup behind them. Sometimes it's elucidating, other times it's totally unnecessary. Like, we don't need to see Jigsaw painting a question mark on that dude's chest. But it always does feel kind of cool to get a clearer picture of the stuff we've seen happen. After Amanda escaped her trap, John was already waiting for her at home and told her, hey, you've got big things coming up, little lady. Jeff walks down a spooky hallway to find Billy the puppet doing a very tasteless reenactment of the accident that killed Jeff's son. He picks up the puppet to get a better look, but after Billy starts laughing, Jeff does that puppet! He walks through a door that says, time to let go, and inside the room and up some stairs, he finds a guy chained around his neck to the floor of this big metal vat. The tape that Jeff plays tells the audience that this is the judge who presided over Dylan's case and let the manslaughterer go with a light sentence. 
sentence. The key to let Judge Holden free is in a little booth full of Dylan's old possessions that Jeff has refused to let go of. His only way to retrieve the key is to incinerate them all with a switch. And why is it so important to get that judge out of there? Well, because there's a parade of rotting pig corpses coming out and getting ground into rancid mush, which slowly but surely begin to fill the vat that the judge is trapped inside. Okay, Jeff, I know you must have learned your lesson from Danica, so you're gonna go get that key, right? Oh, no? You're just gonna stand there and bitch to the judge about the case? Jesus Christ, Jeff, get it the fuck together, man! Thankfully, the judge is a skilled debater and says all the right things, including how he has a son of his own. So Jeff takes his plotting ass down the stairs, seriously, dude, move fucking faster, and goes to the booth with all of Dylan's toys inside. After taking even longer because he's slow-ass motherfucking Jeff, he finally hits the switch to burn up all the toys, giving us that unrated ending to Toy Story 3 that, admit it, you were kind of interested in seeing. The key falls and Jeff grabs it, and thankfully, the judge still has all his breathing parts above the pig mush line, so Jeff is able to free him and pull him to safety. Good job, Jeff. It's operation time. Since John's brain is pushing up against his skull, Lynn's gonna cut that big bone up and relieve some of the pressure. It also provokes some flashes of, wait, what's going on here? Uh-oh, did Lynn just surgery out another storyline for this series? Who's that killer kissing lady? Tune in to Saw 4 to find out. The operation's a success, and John reaches out to touch Lynn's arm and say he loves her, confusing her for that dream lady of his. This upsets Amanda, who looks real jealous of the attention Lynn's getting from her tortured daddy. She has a good cry and flashes back to better times with Jigsaw, like when she went to Adam's apartment to be the pig head that abducted him. Another scene shows her and John setting up the bathroom trap, right down to painting the X mark on the wall and prepping the floor with a bucket of fake blood. John injects himself with a drug that will slow his heart rate and relax his muscles, thus explaining his eight hours of perfect stillness. And Amanda haphazardly tosses Adam's key into the tub with him, then shuts the door for the game to begin. Good times, man. Present day Amanda nuzzles up to John, then gets real feisty with Lynn, who she is just not a fan of. Once again, she's reprimanded by the man she worships, and he makes her leave so he and Lynn can be alone. I apologize for her behavior. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else's behavior you want to apologize for? Maybe like the guy who ordered a bullet bib for Lynn to wear? No, of course not. In the other room, Amanda has another flashback to a time shortly after the first movie ended. She returned to the shit room and woke up Adam to give him some mercy. Too bad it's in the form of a plastic sheet around his head, which she uses to suffocate him to death. And there, with this, we can finally add Adam to the kill count. I know we saw his body in Saw 2, but I wanted to wait until we witnessed the actual act of murder. Also, apparently there are some people out there who think the body in there isn't his. I know the series has a lot of twists, but it seems pretty conclusive to me that Adam's dead. Jeff and his new pal Judge Holden continue on and find the final door of Jeff's trial. He kicks it open and starts a timer attached to this crazy metal trap. The man stuck inside of it is Timothy Young, as the tape around his neck reveals. No relation to Amanda, but he is the man who struck down and killed Jeff's son Dylan. Jigsaw humanizes Timothy on the tape, talking about his family, how he's a med school student, how he felt real bad about the accident, and then introduces the torture device that he's put poor Timothy in. I call it the rack. He says it's his favorite. The rack is gonna twist Timothy's limbs around in a form of some fatally extreme yoga, and the key to free him is in a cage on a rope attached to the trigger of a shotgun. Will Jeff take a bullet to save the man who accidentally killed his son, or will he just be slow-ass motherfucking Jeff? Place your bets. The rack begins twisting, and Timothy cries out in anguish. After being unable to secure the key himself, the judge demands that Jeff help free Timothy. But Jeff just fucking stands there as this dude's limbs get twisted all sorts of nasty ways. Jeff is not an urgent man. After it's all but too late, Jeff finally slowly lumbers his way to the trap and slowly inspects it like he's casually window shopping for shotguns instead of trying to save a man whose bones are getting shattered. He's able to untie the key from the rope and announces his victory at standard Jeff's speed. Got the key. Too bad Jeff is also not a careful man, and the shotgun goes off right in Judge Holden's face, giving us some good classic non-torture gore as he falls to the ground dead from, you know, having his freaking face blown off. Slow-ass Jeff stumbles around the trap and fumbles with the key until he gives up and just caresses Timothy's face while he shouts out, I forgive him! Yeah, that's great for you, Jeff, but uh, Tim's head is exactly the wrong direction right now. Timothy Young is finally dead after one of the most drawn-out and torturous experiences we've seen in these movies so far. If only I could say it doesn't get worse. Jigsaw asks Lynn about her husband, and she says that at this point they're basically strangers and not doing very well. Curious time to be talking about her personal life, and she's not into it either, calling him a monster and a murderer. I don't condone murder, and I despise murder. Oh my god, you know what, dude? You can just go ahead and die whenever you're ready. Or just pour hot wax over one of your Play Me tapes. Whatever. Just shut up with your sanctimonious bullshit. In the other room, Amanda finds an envelope with her name on it, and inside is a note that makes her cry. When she returns to Jigsaw to tell him that Jeff has finished his final task, John tells Lynn that she's free to go now. But Amanda refuses to comply with the order to unlock her. She doesn't deserve to go free. 
John asks Amanda if she felt the same way about Eric Matthews, which prompts a flashback that continues the scene we saw in the cold open. Remember that? Yeah, back when Eric freed himself by smashing his foot, he wound up limping through those tunnels and getting the jump on Amanda. He straight up beats the crap out of her, first with a pipe and then just slamming her against the wall as he keeps asking where his son is. But before he can take a knife and finish the job, she kicks out his fucked up foot and knocks him back to the ground, then grabs her bag and leaves him in the tunnels to die as he screams after her over and over that she's not Jigsaw, bitch. <laughs> You're not Jigsaw. You're not Jigsaw, bitch. You're not Jigsaw, bitch. <laughs> the Operation Room standoff is getting tense. Amanda turns on Jigsaw, calling him a murderer, which, yes, thank you, and denying his philosophy of change through torture by asserting that nobody ever really changes. Jigsaw says that if Amanda fails, then they all fail, so maybe chill the fuck out with that gun, all right? Meanwhile, Jeff has found a gun of his own as he heads to the film's finale. He comes out a door and winds up in the same room full of Jigsaw supplies that Lynn woke up in at the start of her plotline. Do we have another time shift thing going on here? Nah, dude. Jeff's there at the same time all this shit's going down, and he calls out Lynn's name right as Amanda resigns herself to shooting Lynn in the back. She falls into Jeff's arms, and Jigsaw tells Amanda how she just fucked up. You just destroyed four lives. You just murdered Jeff's wife. Yep, Lynn was Jeff's wife. That dude in bed with her in the beginning was some paramour, apparently asking her to divorce Jeff so she could be with him. In retaliation, Jeff shoots Amanda straight in the neck. As he tends to Lynn, Amanda falls down near John, who explains to her that this whole thing was his game for her. He hadn't told her that Lynn was Jeff's wife because Amanda's whole test was to not kill Lynn. He was testing her because she kept setting up unwinnable games like Adam's bathtub key, Troy's chain bang with the welded door, and Carrie's ribtacular explosion. Because of all that, he considers her a murderer. And remember, Jigsaw despises murderers. Having had her brain sufficiently scrambled, Amanda finally succumbs to her neck wound, bleeding out to death on the floor. For some reason, I spent the past 12 years thinking she survived this to come back later. But no, Amanda Young really dies here, as confirmed by Jigsaw himself. Game over. Jeff turns his gun on Jigsaw, but John's like, hey dude, why don't you tend to your dying wife instead of worrying about little old me? It's not like I'm a murderer or nothing. But Jeff ain't learned shit from his trials and tribulations, so instead of taking up John's very strongly suggested offer to forgive him, he powers up a circular saw. As Jigsaw lies there with the smuggest look and smile on his face, Jeff slashes him across the neck, then sarcastically says he forgives John as the old man gushes blood out of his throat. But the last laugh is reserved for Jigsaw, of course, because he's got a tape to play for Jeff. In a kind of weird twist, the tape reveals that Jigsaw has hidden away Jeff and Lynn's daughter Corbett in a location with limited air supply, and that Jeff will have to play another game if he wants to save her. Then Jigsaw just straight up dies. Those hospital monitors ain't lying. This is seriously the death of John Kramer. Yep, and Saw 3. I guess there's no way he could be in any of the sequels, right? With Jigsaw's death comes Lynn's as well, since the bullet collar is now activated. After a patented Saw supercut showing us a bunch of moments from these three films, we see the gnarly aftermath of Lynn's trap. Pretty brutal. And that's how the movie ends. Some stuff was left in the air, but by now you should have realized how much this series is going to be a soap opera, and honestly, I'm all for it. Let's see how many kills this episode gave us, though, and get to the numbers. Ugh. Nine people died in Saw 3, and the victims consisted of five men and four women, the most even gender distribution of the series so far. With a ridiculous runtime of 114 minutes, that gives us a kill on average every 12.67 minutes. Golden Chainsaw has plenty of options, but I'll give it to my girl Allison Carey, because not only is it brutal, it also has this weird kind of beauty about it. Probably because it's reminiscent of the Viking Blood Eagle that Chelsea and I discuss in our podcast episode about real-life saw traps. The machete for lamest kill goes to Adam. It was him or Amanda, and honestly, I I just gave it to him because there was less blood involved. Call me shallow. The platinum punji sticks for coolest trap goes to the rack that killed Timothy Young. No relation. It's so drawn out and brutal, twisting each limb one by one until it gets to the head. And the key tied to the shotgun thing is another difficult but achievable win condition. Rusty mouse trap for lamest trap actually goes to the classroom trap because it's so unwinnable and not for the bullshit door welded shut reason the cops keep talking about. Between the chain through the jaw and the ones through both Achilles' tendons, this is a poorly designed trap that leaves absolutely absolutely no chance for survival. And for every untitled Saw sequel, I'm gonna give it a personalized subtitle to help make it stand out. And thus I give you Saw 3. How slow can you go? And that's it! Saw 3 came out in 2006, and in some ways is the end of a trilogy within the Saw franchise. You may be wondering how the storyline can continue with both Jigsaw and Amanda dead, and you'll find out next week when I cover Saw 4. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. 
This has been the Kill Cow. Thanks a lot for watching today's Kill Cow. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Nikki Soto and Flar. Chances are that by the time you're watching this, I'll be on my way to Texas. I'm so excited. I've never been to a convention outside of California. Plus, I get to stay at Foundflix's house, which is fucking awesome. This Sunday is my birthday, and I actually have a little present for all of you. You'll see what it is, but let's just say it's on theme. Be good people.